Welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning to those of you in the United States, and a good evening to those of you in Asia, in China. Uh, my name is Zhi Guohe. Um, I'm the Fuji Bank and the Hello Professor of Finance at the Chicago Bulls and uh, the director of the Becker Freeman Institute for Economics in China, or BFI China. Thank you for joining the BFI China and the Peking University today for the launch of our new joint seminar series. Uh, we call that Critical Conversations with uh, Economists. Each month we will convene renowned economists from each institution for a critical discussion addressing economic issues facing China and the world today. The series will offer insights into the groundbreaking research being conducted at each institution, evaluated the ever-changing economic and political landscape in the modern world, and expounded the uh, societal implications. It's my pleasure today to introduce speakers um, who will kick off our new series with a dynamic discussion on the COVID-19 stimulus program in China and uh, the, the United States. Uh, let me introduce first, uh, Professor Liu Chao uh, is the Dean and a Professor of Finance at the Guanghua School of Management at the Peking University. He is a leading authority in economics and uh, finance in China and is recognized for his uh, excellent academic works in corporate finance, financial markets, and the Chinese economy. Joining Chao, Thanks, it people. is my- Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Joining Chao, it is Thank my you, pleasure yeah. to introduce my colleague at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, Ch Chang Tai She, Professor of Economics and the Director of Chinese Growth Economic Initiative for BFI China. His research focuses on growth and uh, development. Now we look forward to a great conversation. Um, I will mute myself, and it's really the Chang Tai and uh, Professor Liu are. Uh, uh, taking the main stage. So following the discussion, we will open up to audience Q&A. Um, you can submit your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please identify yourself by your name and affiliation when you submit your questions. Uh, so without further ado, I, I will hand over the stadium or the computer to, to Chang Tai. Chang Tai is yours. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I thought that what we would do is, is that I would just engage in a conversation with uh, Professor Liu. Um, so just to begin, um, uh, Professor Liu, can, can you just uh, tell us um, what are the, in, in your view, the basic facts about uh, two things? One is the death of the downturn, um, uh, in in in, uh, in in February and March, and also just the basic facts about the magnitude of the recovery in economic activity to just get the stage started. So, just what is your understanding of 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 the basic facts? Okay, uh, thanks, Shantai, for for the, for the question. Actually, yeah, I think um, it depends on what time frame we're talking about. Uh, if we talk about a short run, I think it's easy to uh, to get a, a rough estimation about uh, uh, the econo economic impact and uh, in the size of the economic downturn. I, I think uh, the worst time was uh, Q1, first quarter, and I think February probably uh, was the worst time uh, for the Chinese economy. If you look at the uh, statistics, uh, the consumption actually was uh, down by more than um, 20% uh, in February. And uh, uh, if you look at the, the first quarter, uh, I mean, the Q1 GDP actually uh, has contracted by 6.8%. Uh, so that was the uh, worst time. But the good thing is that um, uh, the economy uh, restarted uh, in uh, pretty much in, in, in late March and in April, almost uh, in the whole country, except for a few cities. So I think our Q2 number looks quite uh, positive. Uh, so if you look at uh, what is going to happen uh, in the next um, uh, uh, rest of the year, uh, my estimation is that probably uh, for the whole year for 2020, 
uh, the estimated uh, GDP growth rate will be somewhere around two uh, percent uh, in China, one point five percent or two percent in China. So I guess you no. Know, um, uh, my estimation is that for the whole year twenty twenty, uh, I think the uh, the economy will grow by about two percent, one point five percent to two percent, uh, if we measure uh, by by GDP. And uh, in the beginning of the year, before the pandemic, uh, most economists in China estimate that this year uh, the economy will grow by 6%. So if we do that, I think uh, a rough estimation is that uh, the pandemic has a cause of damage, uh, which lead to a 4% of reduction in GDP. Uh, I think that can be translated into somewhere around uh, 4 trillion RMB yuan. Or maybe you know if we use uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. dollar, uh, I think it's somewhere close to uh, 600 uh, billion U.S. dollars. So that would be my estimation of the damage uh, caused by pandemic uh, in the short term. But if we talk about um, long term, I think uh, it's it's quite tricky here. It's very complicated because uh, we we'll estimate the short term uh, damage uh, caused by uh, COVID-19. I was making two uh, critical assumptions. Number one, the will be second wave. So I think uh, the virus will be contained and uh, it will not be uh, returning uh, in the uh, winter time, uh, you know, later this year or early next year. But we're not quite sure about that because uh, I don't, we don't have uh, enough scientific evidence uh, to show that this is not, not, not going to happen. So that is uh, one of our assumptions. The second assumption is that um, the some side effects uh, caused by COVID-19, especially right now, I think the narratives about uh, uh, globalization, about the Sino-US uh, relation has changed quite a bit. People are talking about the decoupling and also I think the confrontation uh, between US and China uh, is uh, escalating uh, in some dang dangerous manner right now. Uh, so we don't know uh, how those uncertainties may impact on the uh, functioning of uh, the economy uh, going forward, uh, especially next year. I think um, based on what we're seeing right now, I think um, uh, hopefully you know, the Chinese economy has been back to normal, back to the level of last year, one year earlier. And uh, in quarter four, we may expect some growth. And uh, those growth can be converted into about 1.5 to 2% of GDP, GDP growth for the whole year. So I think that that, that is, um, uh, roughly speaking, uh, probably address the second question, uh, the estimation of the damage. Uh, but in terms of how economy is recovering, I think, um, uh, I mean, we look at the aggregate numbers, uh, they look fine. But I think uh, this recovery uh, largely is mainly driven by uh, investment, especially uh, the fixed asset investment uh, has been recovered quite fine. And also uh, real estate investment uh, has been, uh, you know, increasing um, very fast uh, in the past uh, uh, eight months or nine months. Uh, and the good news is that uh, in August, uh, the total uh, retail sales of consumer goods uh, have, uh, the growth rate of uh, 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 total retail sales have, has become positive. It increased uh, by 0.5% uh, compared to a year earlier. So I think that is good, good news. It means that consumption is coming back. So uh, my guess is that uh, it will take maybe one or two months uh, for the economy to return to the level of last year. So as a quarter four, the first quarter of this year uh, will be the you know, addition. You know, we have a grow, a strong growth uh, in the first quarter, uh, that can make the uh, annual number uh, look better. So I, I don't know, Sandra, whether I uh, address your questions no, or maybe you have that, some. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that, that's great. Uh, let, let me try to unpack that a bit. One number that you did not mention is what's happened to either the unemployment rate or labor force participation rates or some. So what is your sense of what's happened there? Uh, uh, inter, um, is, is part of the recovery coming back from, from the fact that, that, that people were walked out of their jobs and, and so um, they were 
maybe not they weren't formally unemployed but they were they were effectively unemployed and, and now that has gone down so what's your sense of that yeah actually uh, this is a very good point uh to be honest i think uh, the official uh statistics of uh unemployment uh does not provide much information about uh, how serious you no know, the unemployment situation actually is uh because i think the official statistics uh did not take into account uh the so-called farmer workers uh who you know who who uh, who went home uh for the spring festival i think in china the total number is somewhere around uh, uh 300 million people uh 300 million uh, farmer workers i think two thirds of them actually work in different cities they work in cities different from their hometown but we do have 100 million uh farmer workers uh working in their hometown they're working in, in cities, uh, but they, they go back you know, to the villages for, for, for the spring festival. So I think, um, uh, think about uh, what happened uh, in, in, you know, after, uh, the, uh, after COVID-19 uh, broke out. I think uh, because of a lockdown, a lot of uh, farmer workers, uh, they do not uh, go to their original uh, job. So uh, we don't know how how much you know uh the how, how worse the situation actually uh is but our estimation is that um, um this time probably is different from previous time uh, because um, uh, what has been hurt uh the most uh, actually are uh, consumption uh, smes and um, um and uh i think uh the confidence of consumers uh for smes in china has um, more or less absorbed uh, close to 80% of total employment. And uh, so I think right now it's, it's, uh, it's very important for uh, policy makers uh, to ensure that um, we, we do not see too much, too many uh, bankruptcy of uh, SMEs. Otherwise, uh, the employment situation will be, uh, will be, you know, uh, will be uh, worsened off. So um, I, my guess is that um, if you look at uh, official statistics, it says that uh, below 5% of um, employment right now, uh, I, I, I would believe that uh, it does not apply to uh, the group of uh, uh, workers I've been uh, mentioning, especially the farmer workers uh, who have um, uh, gone back to their hometown for spring festivals. I don't know how, how, how big the number is, but my guess is that probably still there's still one third of them, uh, for some reasons, are either uh, in a stage of looking for a job, or maybe they haven't uh, left their hometown yet. So that probably will translate to somewhere around um, 100 million uh, people. 100 million people. Yeah. So, so you know, if you take this into account, yeah. Yeah, so let me ask Please. you to, to try to push you a, a, a bit there. So um, how can you reconcile the, the basic aggregate facts which, which suggest that there's almost been a complete recovery in economic activity with two facts that you said, which is uh, the big collapse of the small and medium-sized firms, um, and then also the large number of migrant workers that 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 uh, um, that they don't look like they have gone back. They 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 have gone back to what they've done. Is 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 maybe one way to reconcile that that there was a big distributional effect of 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 uh, that that that. Um, that although in aggregate there was uh, there was uh, it looks like there almost is a complete recovery, uh, but but underneath that there's also a big distributional effect that that we're that that we don't have the complete data on. Yeah, I think this is actually it's a very uh, sharp uh, observation about um, uh, the Chinese economy. It's indeed a very puzzling. Uh, I. I, I I tend to agree that with you that uh, uh, distribution of the income or wealth uh, probably plays its part uh, in this uh, uh, in this story. Uh, on top of that, uh, I would argue that maybe the aggregate economy is is different from 
uh, the macroeconomy, you know, how you know, individual firms or individual households, uh, individual workers uh, feel about uh, uh, the economic situation. Because you now, uh, if you look at the aggregate economy, uh, in a, especially in, in, uh, in the second quarter, I think the growth uh, became positive at 3.2% in the second quarter, but it was largely driven by, uh, by investment, actually. Uh, especially in the investment of um, um, uh, fixed asset investment in industrial uh, in, I mean investment by uh, industrial firms. And uh, I think that tend to help uh, boost uh, the GDP growth rate, the, the figures of you know, uh, GDP figure, GDP number. But in terms of uh, how much uh, individual consumers, individual uh, households, or maybe people uh, living in the uh, remote areas uh, benefit from uh, those numbers. I think uh, we always have this disconnection. Uh, so I would say that uh, it's indeed hard to uh, reconcile uh, the positioning, the two positioning observations. But maybe uh, the difference between aggregate economy and uh, uh, you know the the the, the uh, household, individual, or firms level. Uh, public uh, play a part as well. So this has something to do with uh, the nature of uh, uh, China's growth model, I think, um, because uh, for the government, uh, still uh, when they feel pressure uh, to boost the economy, uh, they go back to their familiar routine. Uh, so central bank will inject uh, lots of li liquidities uh, into uh, the real sector uh, into the system, into the financial system, and also uh, the economy. And uh, in the meantime, the investment uh, will, go, will go up. And uh, that help uh, boost uh, the, uh, the GDP growth rate. But uh, in terms of how you know, uh, households, you know, how uh, individuals uh, benefit from that, I think um, at, at, at least for the time being, it's not the, uh, the, the focus area of the policy, yeah. They still worry about uh, uh, the overall growth uh, in some sense, because they believe that as long as the economy is, go is growing, uh, a lot of problems can be resolved. Otherwise, um, you know, uh, you may have uh, even uh, worse uh, social problems and uh, some other related issues. Well, great, so yeah. let me follow up on that. So in, in, in terms of what's happened to investment, so what is, your best guess on what the investment rate is now? Um, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good point, yeah. Um, in August, or we have a number from the August. Uh, so we look at, uh, this is the most recent uh, uh, number, uh, the fixed asset investment by, made by industrial firms actually uh, increase uh, quite a bit. I think somewhere around 5% to 7% in the range, uh, depending on which industry you're talking about. I think a good thing is that uh, the sales of uh, automobile uh, has increased uh, quite significant, uh, significantly in the past few months. So I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, investments are seen, are seen in uh, automobile industry and also in some of the high-tech industries. Mm -hmm. So that I think uh, the growth rate uh, compared to one year earlier, uh, is somewhere around uh, six to seven percent, which is pretty much back to normal, uh, back to uh, the you know uh, standard, standard uh, situation. Uh, real estate investment actually increased quite a bit uh, in the past uh, uh, quarter, so I think that uh, is close to uh, the growth rate has been closing uh, has been close to ten percent, I think. So altogether, um, I, I don't know, uh, we don't have a very precise uh, number, but I would argue that uh, uh, because last year, our uh, consumption uh, accounted for about uh, uh, 40, uh, sorry, 58% of total GDP growth rate. Uh, so I, I would argue that currently probably investment, uh, invest, investment rate is somewhere around 50%. I think slightly more than last year. That's my guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me just add. So to follow up on that. So so then, if 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 one 
wanted to break down the components of it, trying to think about the recovery. Uh, there's there's a there's been a big recovery in terms of the investment in terms of investment, a little bit in terms of consumption uh, uh, or, or or spending uh, uh, in terms of household spending, but it seems like there, there was less. So what is then is the way to think about what's going on is that there's been a big increase. In, there's been a big increase in the savings rate. Uh, which I mean, I, I mean, one guess of what could be going on is that there's been a that that after years of the uh, after years of decline uh, in China's external surplus, uh, that there, there it looks like that gap has it's it's gone back to being a, a surplus. Like I think that last year China's external balance was a deficit uh, for 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 the first time in years. And, but but now there's been a big surplus, right? My uh, my my understanding of the numbers. Yeah, um, yeah. We should we talk about uh, the uh, expenditure side of uh, GDP. As in last year, uh, consumption uh, accounts for uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, fifty-seven point eight percent of uh, GDP growth, and the investment accounts for thirty-one point two percent of the growth. And uh, net export, I think last year was somewhere around 11 percent. Uh, this year, definitely, situation uh, is very, very different so far. Uh, I would argue that uh, uh, the portion, um, uh, you know, by by investment has uh, increased uh, quite significantly because uh, consumption actually has, uh, in some sense, has uh, declined compared to one year earlier. So my guess is that maybe uh, the growth in the past uh, quarter uh, likely uh, uh, is purely driven by uh, the increase in investment. So that is the situation in maybe Q2, uh, first quarter and second quarter. Uh, but I think uh, what we're saying, uh, likely we're, what, what we're saying is that uh, in the fourth quarter, uh, very likely, you know, if we don't have uh, major external shocks, uh, the economic structure will go back to uh, a year earlier which means that the consumption will start to pick up uh, its, uh, uh, its pace and the uh, investment, uh, in, in significant investment will decline a little bit. And hopefully you now export uh, will still play some role uh, in this year's growth. So, yeah. so let, let, let me ask you a follow-up a, a question on that. Um, you know, recently the Chinese government rolled out what was called, what, what was called a clean place campaign. Um, so can you just explain to the audience uh, your understanding of what that is and also the rationale behind it? So, so, so to just push on, on, on the point, is the view that consumption still is too high? It, it's too high and, and, and then we got to lower the, that, that the China needs to lower the consumption rate? Uh, because that's my understanding of, of what the clean plates campaign is. That is, uh, uh, Chinese consumers are eating too much, are eating too much, and so we have got to get that spending down. Is that the uh, uh, um, because your what you just said is, is that the part that hasn't really recovered is 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 spending. So then is it spending that, is, yeah. that if it hasn't recovered, but then is 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 a view that that has to go down even lower. So just what's the rationale behind that? I, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, I don't have an um, uh, answer for that. I have some guess, yeah. Uh, so probably though, uh, we're talking about uh, the concerns about the food safety, uh, because right now the, the US-China relation uh, is getting a little bit sour. Uh, I think the confrontation is escalating. Uh, but in the meantime, I think China actually imports a lot of um, uh, you know, foods uh, you know, beans from, from the U.S. and from other uh, countries. So I think uh, my guess is that uh, maybe it's out of concern that um, we're going to face uh, some kind of uncertainties around the food supply. So therefore, it's um, maybe it's a reminder from the senior government, the central government, that you got to be aware of this issue. And uh, when you think about uh, uh, you know the economic growth. Uh, in the rest of the year, keep in mind we have uncertainties. 
this is my my actually my my guess, yeah. Uh, but you're right. Consumption actually has not picked up yet. Uh, for example, you no. Know, uh, I can give you another uh, anecdotal evidence uh, regarding uh, why this is situation. Uh, in China, we have uh, in total somewhere around uh, maybe six million to nine million. We don't have exact number. Uh, restaurants, and uh, it has employed more than uh, thirty million uh, employees. Uh, my observation uh, is that maybe uh, only I don't know fifty percent of them uh, can survive uh, this wow. okay. uh, pandemic uh, situation. And uh, but of course, no, uh, those workers, employees can find some other jobs, some opportunities if the labor market is efficient enough. But at least on that front, I think uh, uh, we were seeing a lot of um, uh, decrease uh, in consumption. Uh, people actually stop going out, and uh, uh, especially in some of the second tier or third tier cities. Uh, but I think uh, in first tier cities, in Beijing, Shenzhen, Shanghai, uh, maybe it's ninety uh, percent uh, back to normal. Uh, but still, you know, uh, if you take you know, the whole country uh, into consideration, I would say that um, the consumption actually still in the process of recovery, and it's not there yet. Maybe it will take uh, one or two months. Uh, for the uh, first tier cities to fully move back to a normal level. So that that, that is a problem, yeah. So when you put these two things together, uh, I don't know what, what, what uh, is the rationale for the clean plate uh, strategy. I would argue that maybe it's out of concern about the potential uh, confrontations uh, between US, China, right, that makes and sense. China, so, and some other. So then yeah. do, it, do you have a sense yet on like the, if this clean place campaign is going to be something serious, or is it just rhetoric, or, or let me add the the, the precise question is what is the enforcement mechanism? Oh, so um, suppose that I go out for dinner in Beijing. Um, yep. How does a clean place campaign affect me? What's the precise enforcement mechanism? Uh, to be honest, I haven't seen any enforcement mechanism yet. Yeah. So if you come back to Beijing now, you can order whatever you want to order. And uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's um, yeah, it's, it's somehow you know, you, 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 uh, the narrative changed, but uh, we haven't seen any you know, real uh, impact yet. Yeah, okay, <laughs> we don't have the enforcement mechanisms so far. Okay, let, let me switch uh, uh, the, the discussion a bit and let's talk about the the uh, economic measures that were taken by the government to for uh, for to to get the the economy to where it is today, um, so I, I I would put it in in two things. I, I I would I would think that clearly the most important thing that the Chinese government did was to come down really hard on the pandemic. I mean, so so the, the uh, um, but it, in terms of 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 uh, economic measures, what has really stood out to me uh, um, uh, is 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 how little the Chinese government did uh, relative to say what you see in the U.S. Like in the U.S., we we, uh, we are now talking four trillion dollars, twenty percent of uh, 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 twenty percent of the GDP. It, it almost feels like everybody is getting a rescue package. And the Chinese government did something, and you wrote a great paper on, on, on this, um, uh, on, on, on the, on the uh, shopping coupon campaign. But I guess my assessment is that relative to the US or relative to the Western European countries, it was very, very small. Um, uh, so I want to ask you, is, is, is that consistent with, with what you see? And 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 also just give us a little bit of if if true if that's a case what is the rationale behind it on uh, on the why was the just just to give us a bit of your understanding of, on why is it that the Chinese government did not feel it necessary to you know uh, send money uh, to all the bankrupt businesses send money to all the workers that that that, that did did not have jobs. Um, uh, so just what was the thinking or is, 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 or is fundamentally the issue 
that the people in the Ministry of Finance are just very fiscally conservative, which you know, we can talk about um, uh, you know, whether that's a sensible thing or not. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I got a point, yeah. I, I think um, uh, that definitely is, uh, is one of the reasons. I think uh, the fiscal budget has been overstretched. Uh, therefore, I think the Ministry of Finance has been very cautious about uh, uh, spending uh, too much money especially directing money to uh, to individual households or you know uh, firms uh, they're not used to that they're used to collecting money from those guys not you know, giving money back uh, so that definitely is one of the uh, one part of the story but I think uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, reasons for that uh, which may be reconcile uh, the policy differences uh, taken by China, Chinese government and the uh, you know American government I think one is that uh, uh, Chinese government has been quite successful in terms of uh, containing the spread of vir virus. So duration probably is only like, you know, uh, like two months. Uh, so the economy restarted quite earlier. Uh, it restarted, I think, uh, in most of the province uh, in early March. And uh, by April, uh, it has uh, almost every city uh, everywhere, uh, except you know, Beijing and uh, Wuhan. Uh, had uh, restarted the economy, so I think uh, uh, in, in terms of damage, right, uh, to the uh, to the economy, uh, probably is um, uh, I think the the damage is way smaller uh, than that in the U.S. and in European countries because I think the duration of the uh, pan uh, pandemic has been much longer. It's still going on right now. I, 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 my, uh, my understanding is that in some economies, uh, it has not fully started yet. So that is one of the possibilities. The second thing is about, uh, I would argue it's about the economic structure. Because right now, I think uh, the service sector in China accounts for about 54% uh, uh, of GDP, which means that uh, agriculture and the secondary industry together uh, still account for more than 46% of the whole economy. They are somehow less affected by, by uh, lockdown, by social distancing uh, policies. So that explains, uh, you know, why uh, the government actually was well, not so panic about uh, the uh, economic situation. Rather, in the U.S., I think the situation is, is quite different. We we all know that uh, uh, service sectors account for more than eighty percent of GDP, and maybe ninety percent of uh, employment. So if you have a widespread lockdown, and uh, mm -hmm. the economy uh, stop functioning uh, for a month or two months, I think the whole economy will be in a mess. So that explains why I think uh, uh, the Fed and also uh, Ministry of Finance in, in, in the States uh, have been very quick this time uh, in terms of taking fiscal uh, measures uh, to deal with the damage caused by COVID-19. So I think that's probably the second reason. The third thing I think is um, still about the Chinese um, culture and uh, uh, the you know, Chinese tradition because the national savings rate is very high. Uh, it's still somewhere around the 45% of GDP right now. Uh, we noticed that uh, in the first quarter, uh, when the economy uh, was hit really bad uh, by the uh, by COVID-19, the saving actually household saving actually increases. Uh, the increase by I think somewhere around the six trillion RMB yuan uh, compared to one year earlier, and uh, that explains that you know, people still have some money, uh, spare money uh, to live through. Uh, difficult times. Of course, fortunately, uh, the difficult time actually is quite short. It's only about uh, one month or two months uh, for most parts of the country. And also it coincides with uh, uh, Chinese New Year holiday. Uh, because normally, you know, during Chinese uh, New Year holidays, you know, it lasts for three weeks. Uh, you don't have too much economic activities. So I think that is, um, you know, uh, also one of the probably uh, reasons uh, the government uh, has not been so um, responsive to uh, the damage caused by COVID-19. There may be some other uh, considerations. For example, I think um, the government is still used to, uh, they still you know, uh, have some uh, weapons in their hand. Uh, for example, they can use uh, administrative measures uh, to replace economic measures. Uh, I, I think I'll give you one example. Uh, I think uh, about two months ago, uh, for example, Premier Li uh, was saying that uh, uh, financial institutions in China this year uh, has to ha have to give away 
1.5 trillion uh, RMB worth of profit to the US sector. I, I, I would you know, argue that uh, this is impossible uh, in the US, you know, uh, you can use this kind of uh, uh, policy. It's not economic policy, it's, uh, I would say it's an administrative policy, but uh, they are literally uh, asking uh, the banks to lower interest rate, to give away profits, to sort of facilitate uh, you know, the real sector, uh, the firms, uh, help them survive. So I think those are the weapons uh, quite specific to the Chinese, uh, China situation. And uh, if you take that into account, that'll probably explain uh, why the policymakers are uh, deliberating, you know, which measures uh, work better. So probably you still believe, you know, investment and the other administrative measures work better. Yeah, so Please. China, let me pu pu push you there a bit. Would you say that based on the on China's experience, that the next time that that would you say that the best what that what we learn from from this experience and in contrast with say the American experience is that the next time um, another crisis hit, uh, that the best thing to do is not to undertake the vast rescue packages that the U.S. has undertaken. Because let me just point out the fact is that the U.S. has spent $4 trillion and look at the outcome. And the Chinese yeah. have spent much, much less than that and look at the outcome. Uh, uh, so is, uh, uh, would you go as far as to say that, 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 that the best thing to do is not to undertake these big rescue packages? No, I, I only say that. I think uh, in some sense we're lucky uh, because uh, we have been very successfully uh, uh, contained the spread of virus. As I, you, know, we, we, you, know, you see the, the duration of the uh, pandemic, uh, roughly speaking, is only like two months uh, for, the, for, for China. And the government has been very effective in terms of using administrative measures uh, to lock down cities, uh, to limit travels. And uh, so that is actually work very effective. I think, um, but I would argue that it has nothing to do with economic policies. Uh, the only thing China has done uh, really, really great is that it's very determined uh, to contain the virus as soon as possible, yeah, right. to ensure that it's its own spread, it won't affect uh, the economy uh, for too long. Right. Right. And uh, luckily, we, we, we did that. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we have next time, if we're not so lucky, uh, I would argue that um, um, SMEs, consumptions, employment will be the key policy uh, targets. And uh, so very likely, we have to use a different policy package. Maybe the package will be very similar to what has been used uh, in the U.S. Yeah, if we have next time. I hope I we, we, we will not have that. No, no, wait, 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 what you're saying makes sense. I mean, what you're saying is that per, 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 perhaps the most important thing that we have learned from China's experience is that the most important economic recovery measure is to just, is to combat the pandemic. Uh, yes. uh, that that is the most important thing, that that is the most important thing that uh, one can do, uh, uh, which I, I, I guess I, I would tend to agree with. Uh, um, uh, but then if, in the future, if some other crisis hit, say another 2008 comes around, which was an economic crisis, it was not a health uh, a crisis, you don't think that there's been a change in thinking such that the, the kind of measures that were taken in 2008 are not gonna be taken up again? Or, uh, okay, that, that was not a very clear, uh, Question: What stood out about China in 2008 was that when it was faced with, with a big economic crisis, it rolled out a big rescue package. It, yep. China in 2008 rolled out a uh, four trillion. Uh, so, it's part of what's it's it, it. So here's the question: that that is um, is the lesson that that in response to an economic crisis, these kind of big four trillion yen magnitude uh, uh, rescue packages is, is a lesson that that's a wrong thing to do, or you don't think that that was the 
that was the, the that that's a lesson that policymakers took from 2008, and that's a, that's the lesson that, that policymakers are going to take from this most recent this most recent uh, crisis. Okay, I I I'm not quite sure whether I got the question uh, right. Uh, so you are talking about uh, if we have uh, a lot of crisis, economic crisis. Yes. whether the government should think about uh, keeping a huge package like you know, what they did in 2008 or maybe they should you know yeah, yeah. it's yeah the is question is not question? so much what what the government uh, uh, should do but it's just about the change in uh, whether there's been a change in in understanding or there, there, there's, there's a change in views about okay. what's the what, about what's the most appropriate thing to do in response to a crisis yeah I think um I, first of all, I, I'm not going to say the, the full trillion uh, stimulus package in 2008 is a good thing or bad thing. I think that is, is unfair because at that time, uh, China was also facing a lot of uncertainties and the government actually uh, was eager to, uh, to, 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 to boost the economy, to boost the growth. Because I think uh, at that time, uh, the growth mindset uh, still uh, occupy the policy makers. I think they still have this kind of mindset. Uh, but uh, right now, I think after uh, almost uh, 12 years, I think at least two things are changing. Uh, so which may change the sentiments or mindsets of the policymakers if they run into the same situation again. Uh, I think the first change is that uh, uh, the high growth period has been over uh, in China, officially. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I used to argue that uh, uh, it's easy to maintain high growth uh, if you are still in the industrialization process, but China has almost complete uh, industri industrialization process. So right now the TFP has declined uh, to somewhere below you know, 2% uh, already. Uh, I think in the past, in 2008, or before that, it was 4%, but right now it's 2%, which means that to maintain a high speed uh, growth is, is almost impossible uh, going forward. So I think that is the first change. The second change is that uh, we are facing a very different uh, international environment right now. Uh, actually, uh, in China, uh, uh, policymakers and also the social media, the media uh, take this decoupling uh, narrative very seriously. Um, we don't know uh, before the November election whether something crazy will happen. So people argue that uh, maybe we're going to face uh, you know, very worse uh, decade uh, you know, nine years ahead. So I think that because of the two changes, uh, I would argue that even we are having a similar situation, uh, economic crisis, uh, the government probably will take a very different uh, uh, economic measures. And uh, first of all, they're, gonna, they're, they're not going to target high speed, high growth rate anymore. So that probably will explain why they are so uh, restrained in terms of, uh, you know, the fiscal a st stimulus package. They're quite uh, uh, restrained phys uh, fiscally. And um, secondly, I, I would say that, that you know, they're going to put more focus on the so-called domestic market. And in the meantime, trying to, uh, to, to, to solve the supply chain problems. Because right now, uh, a lot of intermediate goods, a lot of inputs are still heavily you know, uh, relying on foreign, uh, foreign markets, uh, foreign countries. So I think um, they're going to work much harder on those fronts. So hopefully, uh, if the worst scenario happens, uh, you know you have some some something to rely on uh, to cope with the worst scenario. So that that is my understanding about uh, the differences between this time and uh, uh, two thousand eight. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's a great uh, segue to for what, what what I want to talk about next, which is uh, looking forward, uh, looking forward to economic policy. Yeah. So it sounds like what you, you're saying. You you said it a few times now that the main thing the, the the main economic challenge going forward is how to manage the how to manage the decoupling. Uh, uh, so get, decoupling is uh, the so let's expand on that. So so there have been a couple of times now where where the Chinese government um, um, discussed uh, I I wouldn't say rolled out uh, their their policy. I, I I don't remember exactly what the Official, the name was the dual circulation, or, or, um, or so can uh, uh, 
but it, it's still, I, I still don't have a clear story on what exactly are the policies that it entails. Uh, uh, it entails. So I, I'm still okay. trying to figure out whether it's 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 just a slogan or whether there's a there there's a lot of 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 policy measures underneath that. So can you just unpack uh, what? Uh, uh, so first of all, what are the policies that are the, uh, the, uh, the, that e either have been undertaken or that you think is, are going to come in the future in terms of managing the uh, in terms of managing the 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 the, the decoupling? Uh, okay. Uh, so you are talking about uh, I, I don't know whether uh, this is official translation. Uh, dual circulation, right? It's yes, like domestic yes. circula uh, circulation yes. Yes. Uh, coupled with um, uh, international circulation, whatsoever. Yeah, I, I, I want to say th this is actually is um, uh, is a response uh, to what is going on uh, between uh, U.S. and China, and between the international market and the Chinese market. So I, th I would say so it's a natural uh, consequence of what happened. Uh, in the past few months. It has a lot to do with the uh, pandemic. It also has a lot to do with uh, how different countries, uh, you know, deal with uh, the pandemic situation. Uh, because China is, is feeling that uh, we are gradually being somehow isolated uh, from the international system. And uh, given that, we have to think about uh, going forward, what would be the safe economic strategy uh, for us? Uh, if you talk about the domestic circulation, uh, right now, uh, as I pointed out, you know, uh, last year, uh, consumption has already accounted for 57.8% uh, uh, of GDP growth. So it's a major driver of uh, GDP growth. So I think which means that the domestic market has been uh, quite important right now because uh, exports uh, only uh, explain about 11% of growth last year. And uh, I think uh, right now it's only 70%, 17% of total GDP. Uh, and we'll talk about the size of exports. So it's not, it's not you know, uh, as a significant part of the economy as uh, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, it's somewhere around 30% or even more. But right now, it's only 17%. It only account for 11% of the growth. So in some sense, China has already entered into the stage of uh, uh, relying more on uh, domestic uh, circulation, uh, if my uh, translation is correct. Uh, but why we talk about uh, we need this uh, dual uh, circulation? I think the main story is that um, we don't have a complete supply chain. Uh, we rely heavily on uh, foreign economies for important inputs, important intermediate uh, goods. For example, like you know, uh, chips and uh, aircraft engines and a lot of uh, you know raw materials, including. Uh, uh, including oil and gas. Right now, we have to rely on Middle East countries uh, for that. 70% uh, uh, of the uh, oil and gas uh, are imported from you know, foreign countries. So you, you still, you, you did have some kind of connections with the international uh, economic system. And, uh, but when, right now, we're concerned about um, uh, the potential decoupling or isolating China. And we don't know how likely this is going to happen, but it looks like you no. Know, before the uh, election uh, totally uh, settles down, uh, there may some, maybe something crazy happening. We don't know. And uh, so I think uh, I would say this is a background. Uh, we, uh, I mean, the, the, the senior leader uh, raised uh, this term, uh, this this frames, this narrative, uh, dual circulation. Uh, in terms of uh, concrete uh, economic measures uh, to accompany this uh, uh, this mindset, this uh, strategy, uh, I would say you know, right now we're talking about uh, spending more money on uh, basic science, on scientific research, to ensure that uh, uh, this um, I don't know how to say that uh, this uh, choke neck technologies. Yeah. Uh, can be, you know, uh, we, can, we can obtain uh, this technology by ourselves. We don't have to rely on, you know, US or maybe European countries uh, for that. So I think that has been one of the probably uh, most concrete things we have been seeing 
uh, the senior leaders and uh, everyone has been talking about that. All of a sudden, uh, science has become the most popular uh, major in, in, in university right now. We're seeing the change, right? This year, I think a lot of uh, uh, top you know, uh, performers from the Gaokao, the nationwide examination system has gone to mathematics, physics, and uh, chemistry. So we do have some kind of systematic you know, um, um, education there. Hopefully, you know, more talents will be working in those areas. So I think that is something you know, indicating what has been going on, yeah. Beyond that, I think it's mainly about um, um, how we respond to, to the policy environment, right. especially the international right. environment. Right. Yeah. So that's great. Okay. Uh, 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 shall we turn to, to, to the audience now? Uh, I'm fine, yeah. <laughs> so there's a bunch of, bunch of questions that uh, I... I uh, hello? Yes. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Oh. Okay, good. Uh, so there was some questions initially were submitted in, and I will I will uh, organize a bit. So here's one obvious question: Is that what business models would the chip manufacturers in China adopt, increasingly in domestic markets? So I guess it's a direct response to the exactly your <laughs> uh, your trend. You are saying that the, the national entrance examination. People have a shift, so this is a really yeah. one thing. <laughs> can you can you offer certain ways to this question? Actually, I don't know how, how we can do that. Yeah, uh, people argue that it takes you no know, ages uh, to build up the ecosystem for for for, for the chips. You no, know, no matter it's computer chips or what whatever chips. So I think. Um, but the one thing I I want to uh, point out is that. Um, in the past years, the Chinese government has put a lot of money on uh, R&D. Uh, for example, last year, uh, R&D has uh, accounted for about 2.2% of GDP in China already. I think the number in the US, this figure in the US is somewhere around 2.7%. So in some sense, China has been on par with uh, most of the uh, industrialized uh, economies in the world uh, in terms of the R&D uh, level. But one of the problems is that uh, its structure is not optimal. Uh, because R&D actually consists of two, uh, I would say two activities. One is the research, the other one is the development. Uh, I think on the first on the research part, uh, out of $100 of R&D spending, only like $6, less than $6, uh, go to research, like basic science research or research on uh, important you know, technology. And the 95, 94 uh, dollars uh, go to development. So people say, you no, know, Chinese people are very practical, right? They spend the money on the things that can, they can, can become cash flow, become you know, products. So I think going forward, I would say that uh, the percentage uh, on research will have to increase dramatically because this number in the US is uh, somewhere around the 18% in the past, uh, you know, uh, five decades or so. And in France, uh, it's even higher, it's more than 20%. But we have you know, only 5.5% or 6% uh, for the recent 10 years. So I have to say that it takes, year, it takes time, maybe it takes you know, 10 years or 15 years uh, for China to, to pick up uh, on the basic science uh, research front. And in some sense, we, we need to be patient a little bit uh, you cannot rush into this um, uh, this kind of um, challenges, and uh, hopefully, hopefully you can get you know uh, the quick results. I think we need to be patient. So this is why we argue that uh, um, you know we, we don't hope to see uh, the confrontation uh, of U.S. with China will continue to escalate. We do hope that we have a peaceful uh, environment uh, in which you know uh, we can put more money uh, in basic research. Hopefully, you know. Um, China skills can be sustained. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, probably I just elaborate a little bit on the situation right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So Chang Tai, why don't we just uh, end this conversation by Chang Tai? And the Chang Tai, can you give us a some your observations of the current uh, situation in U.S. about this COVID a little bit beyond, and how how does 
how, how, what is the performance of uh, the government? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I see many of um, our audiences coming from the mainland side, and I want to see a you know your your view on the on the on the on the U.S. response to the to the COVID. I think that the, I, I, I don't think there's any other way to characterize the U.S. response to COVID, but 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 a complete and utter disaster. I mean, I, I there's no. Um, I, I must say that the only bright sign that I'm seeing in terms of the U.S. response is what is is what uh, U.S. universities are doing uh, for their recovery. That if that. Um, for example, what the University of Chicago is doing is that they, they are basically, for all the students that are, that are coming in, they are testing everybody. Every single person is being, um, is, is being, is being tested. Um, uh, they have quarantine facilities set up. Um, uh, they have a contact, you know, we have set up a contact uh, tracing, a, a very firm uh, a contact tra uh, uh, tra tracing. Um, 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 a program, and and I guess if you, I think about it, the reason why you know, so we have done it, Northwestern has done it. Um, I think a lot of the universities have are. I mean, we are just starting, uh, but a lot of the the, you, you, the other universities have done it for a couple of weeks now. It's because we have very, we both have the capacity of, to do that. We also have very high powered incentives to do it properly. Uh, because if we don't do it properly and there's an outbreak on campus, you know, all hell is going to break loose, and Zimmer is is uh, Zimmer is going to have his the net cut uh, if, if if there was an out, out, outbreak. But but then yeah. nowhere else in the U.S. do I see it. Do, do I see? It? For example, if you think about the like just the city of Chicago, there's a 14-day quarantine for people that are coming from 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 some of the states, but there's zero enforcement. Uh, so, <laughs> although if, if you're coming from Texas, you have to quarantine if, uh, if you come to the city of Chicago for 14 days. If you decide not to do that, nobody will know. No, nobody will know, and there's there 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 is there is zero enforcement. So, and even over the basics of just wearing a mask, uh, you know, just look, look, look at where where we are. So, I I I do think that in terms of the, the the battle over dealing with COVID in terms of the public health measures, it's a disaster. It, it's a it's a it's a complete disaster. And in terms of the economic measures, I think that it's 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 it's, it's been lots of spending with I think with um, and without very little idea about about what uh, I, I think it's there's been a huge amount of there's been a huge amount of spending. Um, I think with some positive effect, but I think in terms of its effectiveness, I, I think it's been low. And 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 in terms of the magnitude of the debt that 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 has gone that that, that the U.S. has built up now, I think it's just um, it's an, it's it's large. Like we have now surpassed uh, our the debt to debt to GDP rate ratio is now about ninety percent. So ninety percent is the famous. Uh, Rogoff and R R R Rogoff and Ryan are the threshold, uh, over which you know once you go above that the threshold, uh, there's no coming back uh, uh, from the threshold. Uh, um, so I, I say that all around. I think that, that this, uh, you know, the 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 the, uh, the response to COVID illustrates. I think what uh, I think the most dysfunctional parts of the U.S. Um, um, okay. So in terms of the spectrum, I would say in terms of the policy responses, I mean, the U.S. I think has been among, among the worst uh, in terms of policy responses. Maybe if the U.S. gets a new president, there will be a change, at least come to the top. But I still worry about the, uh, just the capacity of, of the U.S. political structure to actually deliver, even if there was consensus at the top to actually do something like, for example, I don't see how the city of Chicago is ever going to have the capacity to enforce a quarantine, or you know how we can enforce masks, say, yeah, on the streets. 
uh, it's, it's just that, that, that the US system is not set up to do something like that. So uh, yep. on that optimistic note. <laughs> <laughs> That's very great. Indeed, okay. it's about like in terms of the capacity. So I imagine that I will go back to China now and I'm, I'm booking the tickets and I will facing 14 days strict quarantine, I would guess. And yeah. uh, I was oh, told right. that the hospital, uh, I was told that the hotel rooms are pretty good and that they will really keep a very close eye on you. <laughs> Those things. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, no. The so thing 14 about days, China, yes. <laughs> no, the, the thing about China, which has enabled them to do this, is that this taps, it, like the response to COVID, and at least the public health measures, it taps into you know one of the distinguishing features of the communist party which is this incredible administrative capacity yeah. uh even down to these neighborhood uh, communist yeah. party committees which i think were important in yeah. enforcing the quarantine sure, uh, wait. yeah the u.s has nothing like that <laughs> uh, yeah uh, yeah that uh, plays yeah. a huge role in wuhan yeah. everywhere uh, yeah. yeah it's a it's kind of like a community right <laughs> <laughs> that's a community yeah yeah, so uh, we are almost the end of the uh, time, and uh, thanks, Professor Liu and Professor She, about this uh, interesting conversation. I learned quite a bit on the recovery side and also the key difference between the uh, 2008 and the 2020. I guess the it, it is it is it is you know on the surface they are. They are also different, but it's interesting to see the fundamental difference between the, these two situations and also the current, uh, the, 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 the economic structure at that time. Uh, so we will, uh, thanks both of you, and uh, uh, we, are, uh, we will try to gather more of this type of a conversation in the future. Uh, next topic um, on the agenda, Agenda we're thinking is to inviting uh, Lars Hansen on um, talking about climate changes and also on the rele uh, related policy uh, subscriptions on, on both the US and China and also the world. Um, so thanks to everybody and uh, uh, we look forward to see you more.